a number of reasons. Like I said previously, we're talking about the state of the church and kind of like where we are today compared to where we were in the past. Um, and I'll be honest with you, after 2020, whenever I start thinking about the fact that it's a blessing to be here, it hits a little bit differently because during 2020, there was a period of time where we couldn't come to church every Sunday. And I'm like, that was like really, really rough too. And I promised myself at that time that I would never take like Sunday mornings for granted. I would never take the liturgy for granted. Just the fact that we can wake up and just show up. We didn't have to register. We didn't have to make sure that there were enough spots. Um, you know, we're thankful because like one of the things that I think that this church does really, really well is that we have great fellowship here. Um, and I started thinking about what that actually means. And this is part of the things where I wish the church was still full because I started realizing that on Sundays, we have a very, very full church. Um, but I wonder how many of those people are actually getting kind of dialed in and kind of like plugged in like outside of the Sundays because that's that's one of our best values. And if you're not experiencing the fellowship that this church has to offer, then we've got to figure that out and we've got to get people plugged in. And it saddens me because, you know, as we even just saw right now, like you have the liturgy and then right after the liturgy, it's like, like everyone like just disperses. And I feel like if you come to church and you celebrate the liturgy and then you disappear, then you are missing like the whole purpose of like why we gather in fellowship, right? Like there's, there's strength in that and there's purpose in that and there's a blessing in that. Um, like we are all the body of Christ and we all function perfectly together, but without relationships, it's, it's, it's different. Um, and it's the smaller, more intimate gatherings where you find that fellowship. So on Sundays we come, we pray the liturgy, we celebrate the Eucharist and it's a blessing. And we enjoy the sacrament, but the, the real fellowship, it kind of, it dives in into like the smaller group gatherings, right? Where it could be Tuesday night for the women, Thursday night for the men, Saturday nights, believe it or not, for Vespers, it's not as crowded as it is on Sunday. We, it's a kind of a smaller group, but uh, you'll find like intimacy and fellowship there as well. Um, so, and, and I'm going to tell you, so today what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the state of the church. And if you still think that that's a blessing and it's great and the financial health of the church, I'm going to let you know, um, I'm about to bore you with a bunch of numbers and that's the banker side of me, but the, the numbers are important. We can't ignore the numbers. So that being said, we're going to talk just, you know, like kind of just real high level stuff about the numbers. So you want to see how the church is doing? Wow. I should have worn my glasses. Okay. So I'm going to have to walk closer. So if you want to talk about how the church is going, this is basically our run from 2018 to 2021. And just to put it in perspective, in 2018, our annual giving was about $600,000, um, just shy of $600,000 a year. And then now we are actually in 2020, we, we peaked up pretty close to the, to a million dollars. So you can imagine from 600 up to a million, huge growth. We tapered down just maybe 30 or 40,000 in 2021. But um, from a banker point of view, that's that's a great trend analysis. If uh, now, obviously, as a church, we are a nonprofit, so we do not talk a lot about profit. What we actually talk about is excess contributions. So you have basically what's tithed. See, Bertie's laughing because these are all banker terms, so he understands. Um, when we tithe, and we have like our gross tithe and what we collect as a congregation. And then we have our expenses because anything has expenses. And then what we do is we we look at how much do we have in excess contributions. And then you're going to see something that is actually, I will tell you, because we do a lot of church um, lending where, where I work. And I'm going to tell you that something kind of extraordinary happened in 2020, where if you looked at, we had our excess tithe of, you know, ranging just a, a little over 100,000, right? In, in um, 2018 and 2019. 2020, do you see how dramatically that line spikes up to, to almost about 400, I think it was $463,000, okay? In 2020, which was, what most people would consider a rough year where we were not able to get together, we pray, right? But I think what it did in that time and why we see that huge spike is a couple of things. Number one, we, we all started realizing how important the church is, right? And even though we could not be here physically as often as we wanted to, we knew that we needed to support the mother church and we were, we were supporting our church. Also at the time, I'll say right hand in hand, uh, the new building, yeah, that was getting pretty real. Because at that point, we were getting our permits. We were working on our plans. We started having plans that we wanted to start breaking on ground soon. We started talking about it as a congregation. And with that, as a congregation, you know, we, we all kind of stepped up and we all made some pretty big things happen. And then we were actually positioned very, very well. Uh, the next slide, year to date, and I'm going to tell you this is somewhat normal in, in the church giving world. Um, the expenses is a gray line. And if you look at it, this is year to date in 2022. So the gray line has been trending above 
the, the gold line, the gray line is our expenses. So our expenses this year, year to date, they've been trending a little bit higher than, than what we've actually been contributing. And that I would say, although it's not preferred, it's a little bit expected because can anyone guess the strongest quarter in, in, in giving for a church? Q4, right? Specifically what month of the year? Because you guys all procrastinate, okay? <laughs> Instead of giving throughout the year, you guys are waiting. You try to sneak it in like the last week of December to make sure you get your tax break. Um, but as you can see in the, like, you know, like we showed in the previous slide, um, we're doing okay. Right. And by the grace of God and by all of your generosity, we that we have plenty of resources. The, the church is growing. Um, it would from the banker side of me, would it be nice to see a little bit kind of trickle in throughout the year? Yeah, of course it would. Um, but we, we end up being OK. So another thing that's come to our realization is our or bond supply. So this is another thing that only the Coptic churches, um, we we're the only ones that measure this. But if you look at the, the, the gray line is our attendance and the orange line is our, our bond supply. Something happened around 2021 and we're feeling a lot of the pinch of it this year. It's that we are not supplying enough or bond for the attendance that we're expecting. And as you guys notice today, how packed were we? We were packed, like packed, packed to the point where, you know, you couldn't walk in the hallways. You know, I was pulling up the bench in the back so the people back there can have space. Um, we had like way overflow outside and it's a beautiful thing to do. And as a church, as part of the board, I will tell you guys that we will work on keeping up with the Orban supply. Okay. We will not let the attendance hinder us in that way. Um, another thing that I was kind of thinking about, so the numbers are, they're nice. Okay. And, and I like that. But like I said, when we we're preparing, like there's just so much when you really kind of think about like where we started and like kind of where we are now. And I was thinking a little bit about like the accomplishments of HTC and what we've actually kind of acknowledged, right? So started in 2014. That's really small. All right. Is it just my bad eyes or is everyone? I, I should just read everything on the slides. Okay, sorry. I didn't think it was going to be that small. Um, we, we started in 2014. So if you think about it, we've only been around for eight years. And I think that we've accomplished a lot. Okay, so Claudio, your thing is not letting me skip to my, it's not continuing to. Oh, swipe. Okay. Um, so we started in 2014. In 2016, we, we bought land. We, uh, we've been looking from 2014. We've always been looking. We were in rented facilities. We we're trying to figure out what are we going to do in 20. Um, in 2016, we purchased a, a piece of land for 1.3, right smack in Chino Hills. It's a beautiful piece of land, and the dream started, right? Um, at that point, just to give you guys full transparency, our, our loan balance right now is at $690,000 on that $1.3 million purchase. And I will tell you from a banker point of view, that's great. We've already paid $610,000 in loan reduction. Um, we've paid about $550,000 in pre-construction costs because we had to do a lot with the city, the architects, the plans, everything that you can even think of. Right now, currently in the bank, we've got about $1.1 million in reserves. And you think about it, these are big numbers for a church that started in 2014, right? Like I'd say that by the grace of God, we've accomplished a lot. And, and if you guys have been paying attention, um, I know we haven't shed like a huge light on this, but we're pretty much ready to break ground. On, on the new building. So we're probably maybe 30, 60 days out, which is a very, very beautiful thing. Um, another thing, just because I'm the banker and like I showed you guys on the slide earlier with the, the donations, our reoccurring donations have grown to 35 families and they total about $27,000 a month. And what I love about that is I love that's 35 families who basically made this a priority. They've set it up and every single month they've got that income coming in because the tithe is that important. Right now, HTC's biggest goal, I'm going to have to walk close again. And if you guys are on our website, our mission at Holy Transfiguration American Coptic Orthodox Church is to live and to preach a life, of transfigure, a life transfigured by our relationship with God through the pure Orthodox faith, fully participating in the life giving sacraments, fully immersed ourselves in the life of the church, and fully striving to imitate the pure and perfect example of Christ. And then if you wonder, why we do what we do, that's it. That's it. And, and if you're coming, I'm hoping that that's your goal as well. 
because we should all be growing in grace, right? We should all be growing. And I'm telling you, every single one of us in our life, the goal, why we get together, it's, it's we need to grow, right? And, and I love that mission statement. It's thorough. And I'm going to tell you, though, sometimes, even though it's thorough and it's wide, we need to kind of like dive in a little bit, right? And kind of make it quantifiable, make it measurable, because the reality of it is that sometimes we just need to know, am I growing? What are some tangible markers in my life to show that? So, what was that? Was that that light? Was it this light? <laughs> okay. It was thunder. Okay. So, some tangible goals, right, is to, keep, to continue our growth, uh, our church family. And what I mean by that, it, it's a good thing when we see the attendance growing. We agree with that? What would happen, or actually, I guess the opposite side is what happened if we showed up every Sunday and you started seeing the numbers get less and less and less and less, right? And I will tell you, like, as a church, you realize that there's probably something destructive or something bad going on. We need to get to the bottom of it. But I'm also going to tell you, if you have a church and it's not growing, then you have to ask yourself the same question. So one of the goals is, look, I know today it was crowded. You know, you might have been a little bit annoyed. You might have been a little bit, you know, crunched. You know, you might have had somebody... Scoot in a little bit close to you in your room if you like your personal face. Um, but at the, at the grand scheme of things, that's, that's a great blessing to have. And it's also in line with why, you know, we've set our eyes on this, you know, that we're building. Because we need more room to grow. Because if God blesses, then we need, we need to have space. Um, one of the things that is important to have more families consistently attend on Sundays. Right? It's not just about having more families on the roster. More families that claim HTC. And there's a bunch of people, and you know, we've been here from the very beginning, where I'll be like, oh, what church do you go to? And they say, oh, yeah, 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 we go to HTC. And I'm like, eh. Like, I'm there every Sunday, bro. Like, I don't, like, <laughs> I've only seen you a couple times. Like, but the, the goal is we need to have consistent attendance, right? And I think, personally, my definition of consistent is at least three Sundays a month because stuff happens, right? But I will tell you, our goal is to have families that they don't wake up and decide that they, you know, whether or not they're going to go to church. It's families who are committed and that, that, that Sunday, it's their day and they're going to take their family to church, right? Um, another goal, better serve families and all of their needs, right? Like we can do Sunday every single morning, right? We can, we have Wednesdays, Fridays, we have liturgy on Sunday, we can do all of that. But that by, you know, that, that's an important piece of the puzzle. But is your life more than just the Eucharist? I think we all have different dimensions of our life, and it's up to the church to meet you at those needs, right? Now, from the financial part is, you know, we've got some big expenses coming ahead, and that's why as a banker, I love the fact that we're so excess in our contributions right now, because right now, when we're in this place, our expenses are low. You know, once we end up moving to our own place, we budget it out, and our expenses are going to be about $70,000 a month. So that's, that's what we're kind of, that's one of our goals is to meet that. Right. Our other goal, banker side of me, is to grow our reoccurring family base. You know, right now, I think we said we were at 35. It's to grow it to 60. Right. And I like that because these are measurable goals, tangible goals. Right. And to have enough for bond on Sundays because there's nothing worse than celebrating the liturgy and totally enjoying it when you get down. And then, of course, humility wise, you let everybody go get the buttercup first. Right. And then you go and you get your buttercup and you realize that you should have just cut in line because now you're out of bond and you're in a bad mood. So, and then to have enough for bond, even when you see that one kid takes four, which we've all noticed before. So anyways, I think we can turn the lights back on, if, just because it's hard on me up here. So, um, so while I was preparing, I was gathering a lot, and I was getting nostalgic, and from the people here, can you raise your hand if you're one of like the first families from like 2014? I know Claudio. Yeah, you see some kind of hands go up, right? And then you start thinking like where we started and where we are now, you know, and I started thinking of where are the different places we were praying, right? Do you guys remember the golf club, the golf course, right? I remember uh, the fortress, um, all of these others. I want to remember, did we pray at a place called The Rock? Yeah, the, bridge. the bridge, that's what it was. And I was trying to remember, I was trying to look it up online, I couldn't find it. So I knew it wasn't The Rock, but, you know, and I remember like the golf course and I remember just roaming around. Right. And there were times where we were praying at a certain place and they were fine. And then they just said, hey, you guys can't be here anymore. And we have to go find somewhere else. And we go pray there and they say, well, you guys can't use incense. And we're like, well, that's kind of important. Okay. Kind of like <laughs> that's kind of what we do. So we have to find like another place. And we were roaming and roaming and roaming until we finally even like landed here. And I remember the blessing of here and the fact that God's hand was with us here. 
is the fact that does anyone know what was previously here? It was another church, right? And one of the things we quickly realized when we were putting together this church was that there's something called a conditional use permit, which is rather hard to get in the, in the city of Chino Hills because you have to actually apply to actually be able to have church services, right? And the people that were here were a church. So they said, if you take our space, not only will you do the, the space, but we'll also give you the conditional use permit which was like a huge blessing because those things were almost impossible to get, right? So you, you look back and I think about that dream that we took up in like 2016, which was that we wanted to build our own church, right? And now we're coming up and it's like, it's almost here. I'm going to say like, you know, as the banker, we're probably 30, 60 days away from that. And that, that's a huge blessing. I remember back in the days and you guys all, if you were here back in the day, it, you guys were struggling with us because we had no deacons, like at all. Right. Like I think even Bessem had to bring out his, his Tonya. Um, I had to bring out my Tonya and we had no idea what we were doing and the congregation suffered for it. But I basically told him, I promise you this, that the chair that I'm standing in front of will never float away. Like that's my job. Don't expect me to oh, whoa, whoa, anything. Don't expect to respond to anything. I even have a specific memory. I think it was our first nativity feast, maybe the first or the second. And Abuna looked at me and said, Peter, you're coming inside the altar. And I was just like, what? Like, it's like, other than holding the candle, I have no business like being inside, being inside of the altar, right? But then I look back now, and now you come to church and you see like this nice group of young men, these up and comers, deacons who love the church, who love the hymns, who are doing all of this stuff, right? And I was like, dude, where did all this, where did all this come from, right? And then you start thinking, I start thinking about all of the other services that the church has, right? Like I remember like when we started our men's group like years ago, and it was consistently like four to five guys. Right. And we see in the office. And I remember if anybody was traveling that week, we'd have to cancel the meeting because there wasn't enough people to like even like to have the meeting. Right. I talk about my wife tells me about the women's group that, that that's on Tuesdays. And now they're going to like maybe 40, even more people. And they got people zooming in. They got people out of state zooming in to get the blessing of the women's meeting um, and how God's blessed like the men's group the women's group and like all these fellowships because that's where that's where I believe that's where transfiguration happens, right? It's not just, you know, when you show up on Sunday, but it's getting plugged into a church where you have real people having real conversations and meeting each other at the meets, right? You know, I remember back when we first started in 2014, we didn't even have a high school Sunday school class because we didn't have enough kids, right? We didn't even have kids old enough, right? Like we tapped out at like junior high. And now you look at like, okay, well, where are we now, right? Like, well, we have like the, the junior high, we have the high school, we have the college, right? We have a servants prep class. Um, and now 2022 is the inaugural year for HTC to enter into the Coptic League. We have our own basketball team, right? So you figure like where we started to like where we are now. And it's beautiful. None of this was here when we started in, in 2014, right? But what I love about it is that each one of these things started in a small way, right? A small way. And God, he put his hand on it. He blessed it and he grew it. And I think it's, it's just a beautiful thing. And, and I, I love the fact because like, you know, where I stand now, knowing where we started and where we are and where we're going, right? I believe that God keeps blessing and he keeps growing. And this isn't the end. I, I truly, from the bottom of my heart, like this is the beginning. And there will be a day he says, hey, do you guys remember when we used to pray at like that one spot? You know, that spot that we used to rent? In the, in the middle of the industrial zone, and it didn't look anything like a church. Like, do you guys remember that day? Because that's, that's just going to, this is going to be a memory. So my question is, is it easy to grow? And I think if you're honest with yourself, it's not easy to grow. Like, growth is hard. It's challenging, right? It takes faith to grow. But I think what God is, is teaching us and what he's calling us to is the fact that, like, you can grow because my hand is with you. Like, I am for you, right? And I think that God... You know, he calls us to trust him in these situations. And there's these decisions where we have something in front of us and we say, okay, am I going to, am I going to trust God? And am I going to work through that? Am I going to walk through that? And is he going to bring growth and blessing? And it reminds me of the story of the Old Testament, 1 Kings 7, um, 17, 7 through 19. And I'll just run through it. Um, it's on the board, but good luck with that. Um, so... See what's what verse? Actually, I will just walk over here. Sometime later, the brook dried up, and this is Elijah. You guys all know Elijah, one of my favorite prophets. Um, he proclaims 
a drought on the nation of Israel because they were like that wicked. Where he basically said, it's not going to rain anymore for you guys. So he sends, so God sends Elijah to a brook where he's drinking water. He's being fed by a raven. It was really like a really nice situation. And then it says, and sometime later the book dried up. And because there was no rain in the land, then the word of the Lord came to him. Go once at Zephyrath in the region of Sidon and, and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. And I have that underlined. Just I want you guys just to think about that. So before God even sent him, he had already provi pro provided a way for him, right? He didn't send him to go figure it out, but God already knew exactly what he had done. It says, so he went to Zephyrath and he came down to, um, to the gate town, the town gate. A widow was there gathering sticks and he called her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I may have a drink? So if you guys were paying attention, what are in the middle of? What did, what did he proclaim? A drought. So do you think there's a little water, no water, an abundance of water? Water was scarce, right? So I, I'm reading this and I was like, well, that's rather bold of Elijah, right? He sees this widow and he asks for the one thing that there's none of, okay? And she was going to get it and he called, oh, and by the way, bring me a piece of bread. So as sure, as surely as the Lord lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah, that's a, that's a downer, right? <laughs> that's a rough response. And I just want to put you guys, I just want to translate that into like today's terms where it says, as surely as the Lord lives, I don't have any bread um, and forgive me Abuna. But that is basically like her saying, look, I swear to you know who, I ain't got no bread. Right? So the, the passion that she's like exclaiming here. And Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make me a loaf of bread for me. But first, make me a loaf of bread for me. And from what you have, bring it to me and make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the, the, um, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends um, rain on the earth. And then she went ahead, uh, she went away and did as Elijah told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil was not run dry in keeping what the, what the Lord spoke by Elijah. And I'm going to tell you, like, that's a great story. And it's a great story for like so many different reasons. Um, and the thing is, when, when I think about that story, it reminds me how God can change an entire situation when we trust him. Because when Elijah showed up, what was this lady's situation? It was rough. It was bad, right? Like she had already accepted it. She had conceded it. She was basically like, she was living in it. Like, so let's run down the story, right? So he, you know, he prepares the house and he tells Elijah, go, I'm going to supply you food, right? He sees her you know, in the middle of, middle of a drought, and he says, hey, bring me some bread, bring me some, um, bring me some water. She responds back, hey, man, I ain't got no bread, right? I'm about to make a last meal for my kid, and then we're going to die. But Elijah says, go, um, go do what you said. Like, if you want to go make your last meal and die, like, that's all you, right? But first, make for me a small loaf of bread. Why first? Right? Like it's a funny thing, and this is one of those things that I love about the Bible, because the more you spend time in it, the more you kind of dig into it, and the more you start reeling that there's not there's not a single word in vain in like this entire book. Everything has meaning. So why first? Because this is the, this is the principle of the tithe. Right? Like this is the principle of the tithe. And the crazy part is, you know, um, this lady probably didn't even realize that, right? <clears throat> See, the tithe and the blessing of the tithe always happens when you do it first. And I will tell you, and if you're honest with yourself, because I'm honest with myself, there's a bunch of times where it's time for the tithe. And I said, well, I've got, I got a lot of expenses this month. So let me like carve out some of this stuff. And then whatever's left over, like that's God's. Like if there's 10% left over, like that's God's, right? But at that point, you, move, you lose the blessing of the tithe. Because the tithe is when you do something in an act of faith, right? It's required of us. It's required of us. Because there's always a blessing to those who put God first. When you see that we don't have enough and you still trust and you're still faithful, right? And my crazy thing, I love that so clear in this story. And I wish it was this clear in every single one of our lives. Um, but
But it's so clear in this story that this woman had real reasons not to give God first, right? Like she was in financial hardship. Not only was it her, but in her opinion, in her vision and what she saw, her perspective, this was going to cost her everything, right? Including her life and even her son's life. But let me ask you, when she put God first, was she disappointed? Not only was she not disappointed, but she had no more needs at this point. She had no more worries when it came to like the food, right? Because he said, because basically, because she put God first, she had no need of flour or oil until the drought was over, right? And I'm going to ask you, have you ever, can you think of a time in your life where you put God first? And he disappointed you. I don't think it's possible. And I don't think it's possible because I, I can't think of a single time in my life that I ever outgave God. And that's not just money. I'm just talking with anything, time, resources, blessings, relationships, whatever. Like you will never, ever outgive God. It's not possible. And this widow walked in faith and never needed to worry about oil and flour again because she was rewarded for her faith. And I think a lot of times we forget the fact, Hebrews eleven six. It says, but without faith, is it, impos- it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And I think a lot of times we don't think about that, right? Like we think of like this relationship with God, it's like it's, it's two ways. And a lot of the times we think like, well, I give and I give and I give. And again, I'm not just talking about money, right? I'm talking about I'm giving time, attention, focus, gifts, talents, and I give and I give and I give. But if we were honest, we have never outgiven. God has always given. Look at everything that you have. And if somehow you think that you deserve that, you're mistaken. 100% everything we have is by the grace of God. Because God is a rewarder. And he's always with us. But the challenge that we have, the challenge is, will we trust him? Will we trust him enough to walk in faith? And I was thinking about how much this church has grown. How much faith it must have taken us to even get here. And I'm excited to see what's, what's going to happen next and all of the ways that God's going to keep blessing us. And I want you to think about how do we grow as a Christian? How do you quantify that? Are there tangible ways that you can track in your own spiritual life whether or not you're growing in grace, that you're growing in faith, that you're growing in virtue? Like what are the ways that we can look at right now? And I know that it's a popular thing to do on December 31st. And we always look back over the last year and we try to take inventory. We try to say, was I a better person this year? You know, was I closer to God this year? Did I do this? Did I do that? Right. But how about we do it on June 5th? Right. How about you do it today? How about you do it throughout the year to basically set some goals for yourself and and not wait until it's December 31st and realize that we may have wasted away another year. And I remember growing up at St. John with Abuna Augustinos, one of the things that he used to say over and over and over again And it's just one of those things that's like burned into my soul. He says, I can always tell you how spiritual a person is. If you want to know, then you look at his calendar and you look at his checkbook, hand in hand. Those are the two ways you can always tell how committed someone is. And I will tell you that that statement always convicted me. Today, it still convicts me. And if you're honest, it should convict you too. Every single one of us. And why would I say that? I would say that because of the fact that it's something that every single one of us wrestle with inherently, right? Every single one of us, there's this tug of war that's going on inside of us, right? And I'll also tell you as a fam, as a church that about 100 families show up every single month, right? I know that we're at 35% of people who have made a tithe consistently every single month moving forward, right? So I, I, I know but I'm also going to tell you that even that, that's a walk in faith. Because I remember when we started this church, we had three, right? And then I remember, because I'm the banker guy, <laughs> then we grew to 12, and then we grew to 20, you know? And then, and God is blessing and God is growing, right? And he's growing and I'm excited about that. Not because the church has more money. We have plenty of money. I'm not worried about the money. I'm growing. I'm, I'm excited because it means that the church isn't growing in numbers, but it's also growing in spiritual maturity. Because in my opinion, when you start looking at the tithe and the consistent, that's, that's, a, that's a spiritual principle and it's spiritual maturity. And I pray that we keep on growing, right? And I pray that we keep on attending every single week and the numbers get bigger. And I pray that more families come to call HTC home, 
right? And I, and I pray that, and I know that it will. I don't doubt that one bit. And I think today we got a great picture of that. But then I started thinking about, okay, well, what could prevent this number from growing? Like, what are the hindrances that we face when it starts, you know, getting close to our, our pocketbook, right? Because I'll be honest, we, we, we know that this is a hard principle to follow sometimes. The tithe might be a little bit too close to home, right? But I'm also going to tell you it could be obstructing our personal growth. So I, I like to do this when I give talks. So I'm going to tell you I'm going to give you four points, okay? The reason I tell you I'm going to give you four points is you can track it, okay? So if I'm taking too long on point one or point two, Buckle up, right? Because we're not even close to being done yet, right? But at the same time, if you start getting bored around point three, you know, okay, Peter's almost there, right? <laughs> we're just gonna, we're gonna push through and we're just gonna kind of let him do his thing, right? But I'll try to work through him real quick. The first point is maybe you don't see what's going on here. Maybe you're not catching the value, okay? Because I, one of the things that I've realized is people part with their money when they see value in something, okay? And maybe as a church, and I'm gonna tell you that we're not a perfect church, I don't think there's a perfect church out there. Um, but maybe as a church, we're not meeting your needs. And if this is the case, I urge you to let us know. Because that's on us. The church's job, like, you know, we have a job in the church to worship God. And the church has a job to serve us as well. And if we are missing the mark there, then I encourage you to let us know. Because we want to serve the people. Tell us. But I'm going to put something on the table now. And is it, is it the church isn't doing enough? Or maybe we aren't doing enough in the church. Because the church can have the best services in the world and it could be transforming people left and right. But if you're not showing up for those, then that's probably not a church issue. And I think it's a fair question because we have a women's group. We have a men's group. We have a Sunday school program. Matter of fact, even on Sundays, we have an adult Bible study that, takes, that, that goes upstairs. The speaker, he's a little bit dry, but he's good intention. So I just ask that, like, you know, my thing is, is plug in where you need to plug in. Right? And if you think that the church is going to meet all of your needs when you just come and treat communion almost like it's a drive through then I'm going to tell you that that's, that's a misconception. It will never, ever happen. Right? But you show up here Sunday anyways. Why don't you just benefit? Take the extra steps. Benefit. Stay. Go upstairs. Engage into another day of the week. Right? Find your growth. See? First point down. Okay? Second point. Maybe you never learned the principle of tithing growing up. It wasn't modeled for you. And I will tell you, I thank God for a godly mother who taught me to tithe at my first job when I was working at Kmart. And I remember that because I would get small checks, $40 checks, $60 checks, right? And she'd be like, did you tithe? You have to tithe, right? And I was like 16 and I, 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 I didn't care. But, but I remember she, she instilled it inside of me. Right? She was always asking. Just because she was always asking didn't mean that I always did it. But I remember she used to just instill that, the principle inside of me. And I remember like I'd get a speeding ticket on the freeway and stuff. And, and then she's like, ah, I can already tell you haven't been tithing. Because if you don't give God his money, he's going to find another way to separate you. And I don't know if that's true. It's probably not. It's probably a heresy, whatever. It taught me a lesson. It taught me a lesson. And, and, and I remember that that was something that my mom taught me when I was really young. So it didn't shock me growing up. And I want to ask you, what are you modeling for your kids? What are you teaching them? What are you teaching them about money? Because look at your spending habits. Look at the way that you spend your God-given resources. Because they're all God-given resources. Okay, I know we work hard for our money, but if you think that that is not a God-given resource, you're mistaken. Okay, and I'm going to tell you, if you look at your spending habits and the way that you spend your money, I'm going to tell you that that's what you're teaching your kids. That's what you're teaching your kids. That's what you do with your money. And how do you feel about that? Because are we frivolously spending on things that don't really matter in the big picture? Because one of the things that people always say, well, I ran out of money, or I don't have enough money, or I don't know where that money went. And I will tell you, as a banker by profession, money, wherever you put it, it stays. You know, in my 20 years of being a banker, I've never talked to anybody who put money on the table and they got up and they walked away. So the question is, is, where are you putting your money? Where are you putting your money? And if my kids just pick up one thing from me about how to spend, I want them to pick up the tithe. I want them to know the tithe. I want them to see the blessing in the tithe. I want them to experience the, the growth in their faith from the tithe. And I talk to them about it. 
And I encourage you that you have to talk to your kids about it, right? I share that the tithe has to be the first thing that comes out, you know, and I know it's different now, right? Because now I remember in the, back in the day, you see people putting the checks in the box, right? And we have a box right there, but I will tell you that I sent all of my payments electronically, right? Because I don't do checks. I'm a banker. I hate outstanding checks. So, but you have to talk to them about it. You have to talk to the fact that, look, when my ACH, like when it hits my account, right? I'm actually a little, probably too much about it. But the first thing that I want to come out is the tithe. Right. And I tell my kids that the first thing that always has to be the tithe. Right. And I share it with them because it's an act of faith. I share it with them. I explain to them why the why the reasoning of the tithe, why it has to come out first, why we do those things. So I'm going to I'm going to encourage you guys. Teach your kids about the tithe. Explain to them what it means. Explain to them why that stuff is so important. Right. Because just like in this, just like this widow. Right. Offering your tithe is setting the stage for God to show up. Like, that's what she did. Her act of obedience here painted the perfect picture for God to show up. And many times I'll be talking to adults. You know, this is something we talk about all of the time because this is something that's close to my heart. And I'll talk to adults and they say, Pete, dude, 10% of my income, I don't have that type of margin. Like, I can't afford just to carve out 10% of my income and just give it to church now. Like, it, it, it won't work. And I'll be honest with you. Yeah, they don't have room in their budget. 100% they don't, right? I believe them. And that breaks my heart. And it breaks my heart. And I encourage them. I say, hey, start somewhere, right? Start in the small and God will bless, right? But start in the small. Don't be the, don't think about the fact that just because you don't have that full 10% that God won't accept you where you are, right? Like it's an important principle. And I'm thankful for my mom. And I encourage all of you guys, raise that in your kids from now so they don't find themselves in that very tough conversation too. When someone does bring up the tithe to them and it teaches them and teaches them about them, or when the Holy Spirit convicts them about that, and they're looking at their checkbook saying that this doesn't, it just, it just doesn't pencil out. Right? You're paving the way for them to be in a tough situation. So, third point. Okay. I feel a lot of people think or they believe that money is what we are lacking. And it's not. It's not. I think if you look at how much money we make, even compared to how much money our, our parents make, you know, or if you compare how much money we make, like across like the United States, across the world, every single person in here is a one percenter. You know, we, we make more than, you know, 99 percent of the people on Earth. Right. Like that's how much money we make. And there's a lot of people that think that, man, that money, I can do this with that money. I can do that with my money. I can buy this. I can invest it in that. I can do all of this other stuff. And that stuff will make me happy. And I'm going to tell you, you're being deceived, if that's what you think. You know, in um, Matthew 6, 24, it says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. And I'm going to tell you, that is biblical truth. Like you can't, you can argue with it all you want. It's just biblical truth. Like when, especially how we spend our money, that is something that shows exactly what's close to your heart. Right. I love this. The hidden treasure. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like the treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and he sells all that he has and he buys the field. Which basically says when he found that joy, there was nothing that he possessed that he wouldn't he wouldn't get rid of. Right. Great pearl. Same idea. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a, be- uh, a merchant seeking a beautiful pearl who then when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and that he bought. And what breaks my heart is when I look at examples like this, you know, I just think of the fact like, well, maybe we haven't found it, right? Maybe we haven't found the treasure. Maybe we haven't found the pearl. Because when you do and when you experience that, then there's nothing you, there's nothing you'll hold back. There's nothing you'll hold back. All right, guys, you guys ready for my fourth point? Okay, fourth point, and then we're going to go into conclusion. Maybe we either don't know or maybe we don't believe God's word. Because when you look at the scriptures, this idea, this principle is clear, right? And it blew my mind while I was preparing this. It says there's roughly about 500 verses in the Bible that have to do with faith and prayer, okay? So would you guys say that those are important principles, faith and prayer, right? Probably top five, like in your spiritual life? Probably, okay. Anyone guess how many verses there are about money in your relationship with money? Over 2,300 
verses about money and your relationship with money. So in my opinion, that that means it's, it's, it's important, right? If you, walk, if you walk through the gift of the book of Proverbs alone, you can walk out with an MBA in finance, right? Because Solomon, who knows, you know, how important money is and how close it's tied to our heart, spends so much time talking about it, right? And I believe that God knows that our attitude towards money is an, indicator, an indication of where our heart is with God. So there's something strange about when God talks about money in the Bible, Right? Throughout the whole Bible, there's one thing, there's this kind of like this theme that kind of reiterates again and again and again. And should we tempt the Lord our God? Shouldn't, right? Should we test the Lord our God? We shouldn't, right? I think we can all agree on that, right? Matter of fact, even in the, in the temptation in the wilderness where he says, turn the, um, turn the rocks, he says, dude, don't, don't test, don't tempt. You know, like we, that, that's a no-no, right? But then there's this great verse in Malachi 3.10 says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. Okay? And again, put that in red. Try me. Like God is basically saying, try me, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessings, that there will not be enough room to receive it. You're good. And I will tell you, like, that's, you have the God who repeatedly throughout the Bible tells, dude, don't tempt me, don't test me, don't this, don't that. But in this specific, in this specific area, he's basically looking at them and he says, try me. Try me. And if you know God and you know his principles and you know how he shows up again and again and again, do you think that God will fail in this area? He would never. Win. So do you want to see God show up in your life? It's the only time that he tells us that we can challenge him. You know, I was having lunch with a friend of mine and he was, he was out with his wealth advisor and he was sharing the story with me. He knows that I'm a, I'm a believer. So he says, yeah, I just had this crazy story. I mean, this experience with my wealth advisor, but we were out at lunch and, you know, he's the one that manages all my money. He does all of this other stuff. And I was telling him that like, you know, my wife and I were struggling financially. We we're kind of like, you know, running in the negative and like, you know, all of this other stuff. And, and, you know, and I, he prepared out like his budget form, right? Like what goes in, what goes out, like, you know, all of this other stuff. And his wealth advisor looks at him and he says, hey, man, um, did you tithe off of your gross or off of your net? And this is, I don't care, you do what you want. This is, this is just for this story, right? He says, did you tithe off of your gross or did you drive off of your net? So the guy is just like, yeah, I tithe off of my net. And he was like, why? And he's like, because I only see my net, right? I'm not going to tithe off of money I don't see. Like, I only see my net. He says, interesting. Okay. Um, when you qualify for loans, do, you, do they go off of your gross or do you go off of your net? I was like, well, they said... No, no, they go off your gross. Okay. When we pay taxes, you know, do they tax off your gross or do they tax off your net? So, uh, no, they tax off your gross. Oh, okay. But when you tithe, you tithe off your net. Even though the debtors and the government, they all go off of your gross. But you're, you're, when it's time to give God 10%, you give them off your net. Interesting. And I remember my buddy was telling me that he's like about to reach over the table and strangle this guy, right? Because he's basically telling him like, look, it's, I already don't have enough. And you're talking to me about almost doubling my tithe. So it, it just doesn't make sense. And he said, my wealth advisor just said, no, it's just, it's just interesting. It's just interesting. Didn't give me any financial advice. Didn't give me anything like that. They finished up lunch. Everybody went home. And he said later, later that, that, that week that like, it was like a recurring theme that came up like another two or three times. So the guy just threw his hands up in the air. He says, you know what, God, if that's the message you're sending me, I'll just walk in faith. I'll listen. I'll do it, whatever. Right? He says, Peter, within the next three to six months, some of the craziest things started happening with my work, with my spouse's work. Like we started making more money, we started this, we started that. And not only was I able to tithe off of that gross amount, I was able to tithe off of that gross amount, I was able to pay off our cars, I was able to pay off any revolving debt that we had and all of this stuff. And I know that it was tied to that conversation I had that day at that lunch, right? And it's crazy because at that point he tried him, right? Like he tried him. He says, okay, I will be faithful, but do you also need to do what you said that you were going to do too. Right, And he showed true to his promises. And when you see him show true, it challenges you to do more and more and more and more. I'll never forget, I was qualifying a guy for the loan. I was looking at his tax returns and something didn't make sense, right? Because it turned out when I was looking at his charitable contributions versus like what he was claiming on his front page of his, his tax returns, he was giving away 90% of his income and he was living on the 10. So I had to ask him, what happened? And then he's just like, no, you know, God... Whenever God blessed me, you know, I gave a little bit more. And when he blessed me, 
I gave a little bit more. And when he blessed me, I gave a little bit more. And it wasn't about when he was blessing me, my, my mentality wasn't, okay, cool. Well, God, here's your 10%. It was, he was blessing me. And I said, okay, well, how much do I need to keep? Right? And when God saw the mentality, he says, well, that's, that's somebody I can use. Right? Because, you know, how much, how much can I keep? Not how much do you like? And it, it changed everything. And he said, Peter, and he kept blessing and I kept giving. He kept blessing and I kept giving. So he was actually in the reverse tide where he was giving away 90% and he was living off of the 10. And I'll be honest with you, if you want to see the presence of God in your life, if you want to see him work, align up to some of the things that are so clear in biblical principle. There's some things where people say, I don't feel God. And I say, dude, it is so clear. There's certain things that you find in the Bible. If you just align up with them, like you will see him show up, right? And as a church, I'm going to tell you that we're, we're doing all right, right? Like the whole state of the church thing, the fact that we're, we're liquid, we're going to be breaking ground. And by the grace of God, we have excess contributions. We're, we're doing all right. And, and all of that stuff's going to be perfect, right? And as a board, we aren't overly concerned with that. But you want to know what we are overly concerned with? Church is growing. Are you growing? Are you growing? I feel like it, even if we stop trying at church, it would continue to grow. But our goal is, are you growing? We want to make sure that the families in this congregation are growing in every aspect, right? Because the church is the house of God. Can we agree on that? Amen? Amen, right? Well, here's the thing. 1 Corinthians 3, 13, says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? Well, you know, we might get real focused on like the house of God. Right, but are you concerned with your temple? Right? Are you concerned with, with what's going on inside of you? Because we want to see that grow too. And I feel that this is something that we can learn from that widow in the story that we share. So now what? Right? The first thing we need to do is we need we need to pray. We need to pray for direction, we need to pray for guidance, we need to pray that the Holy Spirit shows up and tells us what He wants us to do. Right? And I'm going to tell you that there are some things that we definitely need to pray about. And there's some things when God calls us to do hard things that we definitely need to pray about. Maybe even pray about it in community. Approach a confession, Father. But I'm going to tell you that there's other things that we don't need to pray about. Because it's clear in the scripture. And there's a lot of things in the scripture that we just need to do. And we don't need to commit it to prayer to see if God agrees with it. Because his principles and his guidelines are clear. The next thing we need to do is we need to obey. Originally, I put obey even when it doesn't make sense. But I thought about it, and I thought about times in, our, in my life, and I said, obey, especially when it doesn't make sense. Because when he tells you to do something and it doesn't make sense, that's when I know that God is telling you to do something challenging. Do things that require faith. It's very easy to do the things that are easy. But maybe put yourself in a situation where you have to step into something challenging. Where it's like God will pick up right where we end. And we need to step in those situations that we will cry in. And then allow your faith to grow. And I pray because our, our goal as the board is that we're going to do these meetings annually. So every year we're going to get together, we're going to talk about how the church is going. But I feel like it would be a big miss if we, had, if we only focus on the church. But we're also going to see how are you doing? How are you growing? How is your faith growing? Are you growing in faith as well? And I pray that when we have this meeting this time next year, that you'll look back and you'll be like, it was a good year. There was a lot of growth. Amen? And glory to God. Did you guys see where Abuna went? All right, I'm going to actually give me a quick second. And if he is not in the altar, then we'll just stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord, because you've provided so much, Lord. You've given so much. But Lord, I ask that we don't get distracted with all of your blessings, Lord, that we don't get distracted with all of the things that you provide for us, Lord, and they distract us from you. But Lord, allow us to be a funnel for you, Lord, that all the goodness that you pour into us, Lord, that it's directed right back to you. Lord, whether it be in our services, Lord, our relationships, Lord, I ask, Lord, that your goodness is not just wasted on us, Lord, but that we actually turn it back to you and that we are that we are faithful. So, Lord, the same way that I know that this was a message from you today, Lord, I ask that you continue and that you speak to every single one of us here individually, Lord, in the way that you want us to act in faith. 
For Lord, I know that you've prepared a way of good works for us to walk through as you told us in Ephesians 3, Lord. And I ask that you just, that you open our eyes to it, Lord. That we can take one step closer to you, Lord. So Lord, I ask that this, that this be practical. I ask that you wrestle with hearts, Lord. That you give every single person here an action item that we can implement, Lord, because we want to see your glory. The same way that when this widow, when she offered, Lord, and she saw the way that you showed up, Lord, that was something that she could never deny, Lord. And you kept her satisfied. I ask that you do that with every single one of us here. Lord, show up in a way where your hand is so big that we would never be able to question it. I ask that you give us the type of faith that it requires to do something like that. Lord, I ask that you bless this church, that your hand continue being on it, that your hand continue blessing it. I ask, Lord, that uh, not only this church, Lord, but every single one of our homes, which is an individual church, that you bless it and that you just grow it as well. So that when we come back here, Lord, when you take all of these families, you put them together, that we will be a great church. I ask, Lord, that we, that we be a lamp on a light, uh, a lamp on a lampstand, Lord, and a city on a hill. I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord, that you forgive us our many sins. As you hear these prayers lifted in the session of our saints from our tears, here we pray one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 